Blowouts might be the only thing that K-State knows how to play now. The Wildcats, they beat Arizona a couple weeks ago in blowout fashion here in Manhattan. Last weekend, they get blown out themselves in Provo, Utah, but they return home to throttle Oklahoma State for the second consecutive time in Bill Snyder Family Stadium, this time not as grisly as the 2022 season. But 42-20, to K-State takes down the Pokes today. I'm Mason Voth. That's Drew Galloway. Welcome to K-State Online. Let's start with probably the man of the hour, big day for Avery Johnson. Kind of started to see more and more of those flashes of what everybody was expecting where it's – I guess they're not even just flashes at this point now. They're more like moments and periods that he's having because today he ends up running for 60 yards, two touchdowns, and then his throwing was, was okay, better probably. Attacked downfield a little bit more, was better in that situation, but 19 of 31, one pick but three touchdowns and 259 yards – and the receivers, they still have some room to grow. I think the quarterback receiver situation, they need to get on the same page a little bit better, but they've at least shown today they can make some plays, and that was probably the biggest thing to help the K-State offense. Yeah, I think that today was probably – it wasn't a perfect game for the K-State offense, but that's pretty dang close to score 42 points and really dominate from the opening drive. There, there was a, a few stall outs in the first half but turned around and responded really well. And if it wasn't for a pass interference on the offense that was kind of 50-50, you might have had 28 points in the first half. So you put it all together, and you did get a complete game from Avery Johnson. I said that the Arizona game was his most complete game at K-State, but it has to be today against Oklahoma State now. And you really got to see – I would also say that there are moments because that, that, that second touchdown run, his last touchdown of the game, that was a special moment and a special kind of player that makes that play. Yeah, the, we saw the elite playmaking and using the athleticism and all that today. You mentioned penalties. Those reared their ugly head once again for K-State, and that's another one of those where when things go poorly, it's better to be at home because they did some things wrong that they had done in Provo, that they had done in New Orleans, and they were able to overcome it much better here. Some of the penalties – Felt like if K-State did something that was borderline, it was a flag every single time. So, uh, you know, I'll give them a little bit of a pass there, like the pass interference you mentioned. But once again, we saw early in the game penalties that aren't necessarily physical, but more so using your head and the mental side of the game, costing K-State yards, situations, a touchdown early on. What did you make of K-State and how they performed in the penalty department once again? It still was kind of shaky. You saw a couple second uh, penalties in the secondary. You saw a touchdown get taken off the board on the first drive. Uh, the one on the first drive, though, in the offensive pass interference, I, I'm okay with more in the sense that I think that the first one is probably more on Avery Johnson than the receivers because he checked into it and checked into that play so fast that I don't think the receivers actually knew what, the, what play was being called. So I think that that hurt. The offensive pass interference we hit on was, it was a borderline one. The, the ones in the secondary are the ones that kind of leave me scratching my head because both holding po- penalties were kind of avoidable. So I, I think that you see and saw case it really attack better and do better in the, the discipline department in the secondary in the second half. But all in all, it was kind of a mixed bag. But at some point, I think that that's just going to be what K-State is because you have inexperience on the offense, and the secondary has just kind of been a mess, for lack of a better word, for most of the season so far. Well, the secondary came away with two big picks today. Jacob Parrish had a great one in the end zone. Marquis Siegel had the first, and it kind of, again, stalled Oklahoma State once they basically got inside the K-State 30, 35-yard line. What did you make of how the secondary played today? Because early on, it was not looking very good for them. They bounced back well enough, but this group still is a little concerning, especially when you think about K-State's making enough mistakes right now to where that puts them playing down to the level of Colorado, where we know there's a lot of talent for a Colorado team that K-State will see in two weeks. But they make a lot of stupid mistakes. Well, K-State's trying to match them right now, and that might be a scary thing moving forward. Yeah, early on, it was really rough. I mean, it was it was receivers were just open, running wide open on every play, it felt like. Second half, it was better. But the thing that kind of brought it into my mind was how much of that is Oklahoma State 
because the first half, what worked for Oklahoma State was more RPO game. Second half, they did more drop back passing. And Alan Bowman's a lot of things, as a KSU underscore fan put it in in the, uh, the press box today. But a drop back passer probably isn't one of them. He's really good in the RPO game. I was going to say good is not one of them. That, so I mean, sorry, Alan. But we're the valid. same age, so I feel okay taking those those uh, somewhat critical shots at you. Yeah. It, it's interesting. They they struggled. VJ Payne got run over by Ollie Gordon at one point, and that was maybe the thing that should have had people concerned early on is that this Oklahoma State offense that had really struggled to find themselves all of a sudden had things moving in the right direction. So you can be critical of what K-State did early in this game, but they do probably at least deserve credit for putting it into it and kind of getting things back in order. Yeah, and to that point about Ollie Gordon too, Ollie Gordon had, I believe, like 72 rushing yards in the first in the first quarter and only had three the rest of the game. So K-State really tightened up defensively, and that, that won them the game because I think that the K-State offense was going to be able to put up points no matter what. It was going to be, can they get enough stops? And I think that the turning point that we kind of talked about in the first half was after the interception, Oklahoma State starts the, their drive after the interception with two Allen Bowman-designed runs and settles for a field goal and K-State goes back and immediately scores right after to go up 14-13. to 13. That really swung the game along with the fumble, uh, the fumbled snap, and then Desmond Purnell just laying out Allen Bowman. That way, Colby McAllister could pick up the ball, and K-State going out, down and scoring. Those two plays, I think, really swung the tide in K-State's favor in a major way. Yeah, offensively, tight ends, still a big point of this offense, even with Braden Lofton out. Garrett Oakley caught the first. Will Ancio had a touchdown in the game as well. And I think the offense, number one, execution was a little bit better today. That helps Connor Riley look good. I think Connor Riley was better for the most part today. There were still some moments in this game, though, where you really scratch your head. And probably the first place to start is when K-State has it third and one around, what, their own 35, somewhere in that range. And they decide to throw the ball instead of just give it to DJ Giddens. And that's another thing. DJ Giddens today was phenomenal. 15 carries for 187 yards and the one long touchdown. Yet it feels like K-State didn't give him the ball enough, and that's a situation where that should always be DJ Giddens football unless you think you're going to quarterback sneak it, and we know they're not 100% comfortable doing that with Avery. Yeah, I, I think that that would kind of be like the one quibble would be one of those third down plays where it was third and short in case state likes to throw it. But I, it is crazy, though, that DJ Giddens, again, just goes so under the radar that we're – a while into this and we're just now mentioning the game that he had because he had probably the best game of his career and was able to really explode and make a big play on that six yard touchdown run that I think that a lot of us were kind of concerned that he was going to get caught from behind but had just enough speed to score uh, but play calling was good and, and it was really good in the red zone uh, I'm also starting to think that I need to if I suited up as a K-State tight end, do you think I would score a touchdown? Brian LaFax got that room rolling in the red zone. I think you'd have a good chance. I think it just depends. Well, you're also smaller than these guys, so even less opportunity for them to see and be like, who's this white guy just running behind us here? Get, get Andrew Metzger in the game and get him a touchdown. That'd, that'd be five for five. Right? Uh, make it happen. Let's let's see how it uh, goes there. Now, I, thinking about how the, the offense kind of operated today and everything that, that, that goes into it, getting closer to what I think people want, not all the way there yet. Is it going to get to a point where this offense stalls out and we have to say they are what they are, their deficiencies are going to be there all season? Or do you still see big growth coming for this group? I think that you still get, have big growth coming from this group because of Ever Johnson. He is already a pretty special player, but he's going to keep developing and growing more and more as the season goes on with more reps. So I, I think that you can't say they've hit their peak yet. But th this would be pretty close for me. I mean, this is 42 points on a Big 12 team that has been shaky on defense this year, but is traditionally really solid on the defensive side of the ball. And they were able to get whatever they wanted for the most part today. Yeah. Defense. Where where do you stand on what you've seen from the defense through, what, five games now that, that we sit here? Concern moving forward because they seem to be playing – it's weird because the BYU game, they seemed up to the task, and then they started off really slow today, eventually found it. Some of that has to do with the fact that the offense was able to put Oklahoma State in such a hole. So I'm interested to hear what you think of the defense right now and what you expect them to be moving forward. 
They have a lot of work to do during the bye week. I think that that's the position group. Like, I'm more concerned about the defensive side of the ball than offense, and I think that that is probably a thing that's not going to be very popular with a lot of K-State fans. But the defense, I thought, was going to be the strength of this team and, and really hasn't been that great in the first five games. So if they can find a way to figure it out, I think that really raises the ceiling of this team as a whole. And I'm not overly concerned going forward because I think that Joe Klanderman and Chris Kleiman are good enough that they will figure something out. But right now, there there are some moments where you're like, how is this guy so wide open in the secondary? And I thought that the secondary was going to be probably the best unit as a whole on the team. And the secondary has probably been one of the worst position groups as a whole. Yeah, they're definitely holding them back a little bit. Didn't matter today, though, 42-20, and K-State gave up that one garbage time it score. It was basically 42-13. to Yeah, also, I mean, kind of a weird game for Mike Gundy. It seems like O-State just kind of rolled over and was cool with dying. Um, and they, I think, were trying to let K-State score 50 points. Not a good time for Mike Gundy in Manhattan, and he's really lucky that it's not been a third straight loss because if you think about that 2020 yeah. game, I mean, Will Howard kind of literally handed it to Oklahoma State. So, K-State in a good spot at home against Oklahoma State the last two tries. Makes sense. Cooper Beebe, Deuce Vaughn were on hand today for this game. So, that will do it for us today for Manhattan. Next time we talk to you after a game, Royals will probably be gearing up for an American League Championship Series. But we'll be in Boulder, Colorado. In another time zone. In another time zone, yeah. We've yeah, already been in the mountain time zone. But, we had you know. three time zones the next three games. Got to love it. That's Big 12 football. Uh, I don't think anything else really to, to get to, tell everybody to worry about. So everybody enjoy the bye week. Enjoy a week of enjoying this game, getting to laugh at teams that have lost and not have to worry about K-State and whatever else ends up happening. So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching K-State Online. If you want more on the Cats, stick around right here on the YouTube. You can watch all the press conferences, other post-game coverage, and also head to On3 where you will get a lot of insight on this game, recruiting, everything else that you need right now. And uh, when we make that trip out to Boulder in a couple of weeks, we'll be making a pit stop in Goodland, Kansas to see Lincoln Cure. I know that is hot on the minds of a lot of K-State fans out there after maybe some flirtation and some stories from Oregon. He was at KUTCU today. We'll have that all covered on KSO. We'll either make you panic more or put your mind at ease. One way or the other, we'll see you next time.